up his own and as usual will keep you informed, educated and also entertained. Tonight's highlights, Uganda on the age as Kenya's bi-weekly protests assist, the National Social Security Fund issues a 30-day ultimatum to employers to register and remit contributions, small and medium enterprises struggle to access the Small Business Recovery Fund and low trade among African countries who are its experts. I'm your host, Dennis Sigoa. Keep it locked. To our first story, Uganda's business community are advised to diversify their routes by utilizing other trade routes. The appeal by private sector leadership comes amidst by weekly protests in Kenya that threaten to severely interrupt business. Our reporter, Amuge Charlotte, has the details. The trend is proving costly to businesses. Uganda is a high cost importer and any disruption uh, causes trade uh, issues, cost spike. Huh? And therefore, we need to already think of alternatives. Huh? The Ugandan business community is affected, says Francis Kisirinya, an official at the Private Sector Foundation Uganda. Yes, we've received uh, a number of reports about disruptions in the floor of, of, of goods from, from Kenya uh, because of these challenges of uh, uh, this, the, the, the riots and the demonstrations that are actually going on. What we have seen in history just recently as uh, last year, Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, you remember when the, the drivers refused to drive trucks because they were being checked. Mm -hmm. I think it took just a few days for prices of fuel to go up, you know. So if, like we are hearing now, uh, people are going to be uh, demonstrating every Monday, every Thursday, you know, it might amount to something that really slows down goods coming to Uganda. And then that disgusting, the moment disgusting comes in, or they start, people start feeling that they are uncertain. My cargo may not come in in time. You might, you might start seeing uh, some changes in prices. Other private sector players are not different. Somebody put our things, they didn't pay us since 2008. We are demanding them a lot of money. Our wish and is that that disruption is minimized so that trade flows. I think uh, there can be an appeal to the leaders to find ways and means of dialoguing so that we minimize the disruption in trade and by extension disruption in financial flows. Past skirmishes in Kenya have had dire consequences to landlocked countries like Uganda that overly relies on the northern corridor. I believe for the business, individual business people, it is important for you to diversify and see what component of your cargo goes to the southern route, which is the, the, the route that goes through Dar es Salaam. We are aware today that um, the Dar es Salaam route, uh, the government of Tanzania and the Tanzania Post Authority is trying to improve this particular route. And uh, you remember when President Suluhu came here, it was us as private sector that re requested that she helps this country and improve the way we, the, the port uh, operates. And indeed, they have done some of their part of the bargain. For instance, they have now opened an office of Tanzania Ports Authority here in Uganda. So for Ugandan traders, Ugandan manufacturers and business people, uh, let's start to di 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 diversify the routes. Let's make sure that some of our goods come from through uh, Dar es Salaam. Tanzania routes is for us. We have much stronger historical relations with Tanzania. I don't have time to take you history. The people who fought against colonialism, like Kabalega, they were using caravans of the Nyamwezis bringing in weapons. Eh? So, in my opinion, routes should all be open. See, as a businessman, there is no such a thing as this one is better, this one is. No, no, no. I need options in order for me to cost my raw material imports and my final product exports. So Tanzania gives us the malt model, the sea, the railway, and the lake. So your port bell, Bukasa hasn't started, but port bell, and the vessels that are there, MV Kawa or Umoja, should now be a little focused on afresh, just so that we have more capacity available on the lake, URSC now makes more sense with Tanzania Railways Corporation. 
But that's in no way at all. So, and so the Malto model, so you have that and then you have Mutukula. Mutukula gives us Masaka and then uh, the western part of Uganda. The business community, therefore, must reduce their risks by utilizing other trade routes in the region. Tanzania's Central Corridor is the most viable. It is often argued that when Kenya, the East African community's biggest economy hopes, the rest of the member states catch a cold. The bi-weekly protests in Nairobi, Kenya, have literally put Uganda on the edge. Charlotte Amoge for the Business Roundup. Harmonization of standards, mindset change, and improvement of quality of products are cited among important factors vital in growing intra-African trade. This was observed at a high-level continental standards meeting in Kampala. The African Regional Standards Organization is an arm of the African Union formed to champion the dream of African continental free trade area whose goal is to enhance continental trade. African countries trade more with foreign countries than among themselves, with recent statistics showing that trade among African countries is barely less than 15%. Uh, I would call it mindset. Mindset because it's uh, about um, uh, consumers. Uh, we consume what we don't produce and we produce what we don't consume. Uh, if I cut it short, yeah, we should produce for the African market. Yeah, we, we don't lack the numbers. We are 1.3 billion of people and we are still actually increasing. This situation is attributed to many barriers, among them quality of products, protectionism, deferring standards and mindset. Those who have gone to China to set up plants have gone there because they want cheap labor. There's a big market and nobody, nobody, let's not be under any impression that anybody is going to come from anywhere and help us. Pass good standards, which you have always been doing. Make those standards known to the people because the institution that I had, every time I ask people whether they know what UNBS does, all they know is that we confiscate goods. <laughs> so they think we are like another police organization. As you know now, standard is a key, a, a key, uh, a key component for accessing these markets. We have negotiated markets to waive the taxes, to also waive the quantities or restrictions on volume. So they are quarter free, tariff free, but. What cannot be waived off is standard. So we are saying that, acknowledging that standard now remains the one single constraint, we now need to make sure that we encourage and support our traders and exporters, manufacturers, and those involved in value addition to appreciate the role of standard in business growth, but specifically to promote international trade. The focus of the African Regional Standards Organization meeting is to bridge existing gaps through harmonization of standards. Currently have over 1,200 African standards. This is the indigenous African standards across all sectors to be able to make sure that we promote trade among ourselves. So we are trying to make sure that we popularize these standards and engage with the African countries since we are all experts here now we need to go into mutual recognition agreement so that whatever country certifies a product that is safe and good for Africa, we should be allowed to freely trade. There is no reason why we should seek permission to trade among ourselves. The experts need to ensure all standards required for African products are harmonized across the region. Dennis Igoa for UBC Business. The National Social Security Fund has issued an ultimatum of 30 days to all employers across the country to register with the fund and remit social contributions for their employees. The appeal is geared at strengthening compliance within the law and increasing the number of savers. Let's have a look. The employer registration drive is in line with the new NSSF Act provisions that introduce mandatory contributions by all workers, regardless of the enterprise or number of employees. We exist when employers exist, so we go to great lengths to make sure that the employer actually survives. Once in a while you run an employer who has actually deducted money from the employee's check and they stubbornly not send the money. And in that case, you really have to go hard on that employer because in a sense they stole from the employee and we don't tolerate that because 
you as a young man or a young woman, you're going to, 55 is going to come very soon and you'll need that money. Unlike the past when the definition of employer was ambiguous, the amended act provides clarity on who is eligible to pay NSSF for their employees. We've also been able to collect 15 billion shillings from newly registered members. Mm -hmm. So people that were not members of the fund last financial year, within just this financial year so far, have been able to contribute 15 billion. So again, that goes to show you that if we target to register more members and to bring on board more companies, there is also a lot of money that we can be able to collect. Mm. NSSF has partnered with public and private stakeholders to ensure that employers regularize their status so as to avoid financial penalties. The penalty is 10% per month on the outstanding amount that should have been contributed. For example, if you got two employees, they each earn 500,000 shillings. Basically, that means that each month they need to be contributing 25,000 shillings of their own money and 50,000 shillings that you match. So they need to contribute 75,000 shillings. And you don't. That first month, the penalty is 10% of 75,000. We want to ask you to intensify the education. Let's educate our MSMEs. As MSMEs do not appreciate the value of social security. Every small money matters to them. So they need to appreciate why it's important to comply. Since the introduction of the mandatory contributions by all workers, regardless of the size of the enterprise, over 3,200 employers with less than five employees have registered with the fund. Charlotte Amoge and Dennis Igor for UBC News. Small and medium enterprises in Uganda have been struggling to access the small business recovery fund put together by government and the commercial banks to help them recover from the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the Bank of Uganda, as of September 30th, only eight participating financial institutions had disbursed loans amounting to 4.8 billion shillings. <laughs> <laughs> the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises has been advocating for greater participation from financial institutions and a more streamlined process for accessing the fund. Only 7 billion shillings has been disbursed out of the 200 billion. And the challenges, I would say, are mainly due to uh, the limited awareness by the MSMEs, the unclear requirements when applying, but also the hesitance by financial institutions to lend at a, an interest rate of 10%. The participating financial institutions are Opportunity Bank, Pride Microfinance, Trust Bank, Post Bank, Housing Finance Bank, Diamond Trust Bank, Centenary Bank, DFCU Bank and Equity Bank. While these numbers suggest that some progress has been made in disbursing the loans to SMEs, it is still a relatively small amount compared to the 200 billion Ugandan shillings in the Small Business Recovery Fund. If they are planning for the people, I think we should be consulted first, either they get to know what we need so that they budget for us well. They argue that the limited participation from financial institutions is hindering the effectiveness of the fund in supporting small businesses. I think engaging them will be for another day, but for now we want to work with those that we believe have bought into the Small Business Recovery Fund and are willing to disperse. Of course, they have genuine concerns. They are saying, now you're asking us to give money at an interest rate of 10%, yet um, you know we are our own money is being given out in that 20s or whatever. So this may affect the competitiveness of our own products. In response, Bank of Uganda and the FSMEs are working together to increase awareness of the fund and to encourage more financial institutions to participate. The upcoming awareness events at Umasho Grounds in Kampala, Soroti, Mbarara and Arua are part of these efforts. It can be like 5 million. 5 million can be enough to start this, this, this business because uh, most of the people here in Kampala, like if you have a very small stock, they won't buy from you. 
I only need some hard cash, nothing else. The effort of government and the central bank, along with the federation, to increase participation and streamline the application process are critical to ensuring that small business owners can access the support they need to recover from the pandemic. Wadulo Makanold, UBC News, in Kampala. Government is focused on broadening its relationship with the private sector in order to digitally transform the economy. This was observed at the Huawei ICT convention in Kampala. Uganda needs to benchmark from countries rich in technology to achieve the 2040 goal on digital transformation. The ICT minister Chris Baliomose says enough resources should be allocated to ICT in training and research. Move faster as Uganda, as African countries, but that requires us to allocate more resources into the area of ICT because research is going on and many technologies are being brought on board. We may not have to reinvent the wheel to come up with these technologies. We just need to draw lessons from those countries which already have those technologies and see how to adapt them and how to integrate them within our system. Government is here to acquire a loan from the Exim Bank to facilitate connection of all districts on digital platforms and ease communication across public agencies. Government transitioning from manual processes to electronic and digital services. The Ministry of ICT's partnership with Huawei will boost digital transformation. Campus Network Solutions. Campus Network is uh, the land network. Networks in offices, in schools, in industries and all that. To show them what is the latest in the industry and to show them that it's not very hard to get there. Now in the Enterprise Business Group, we provide end-to-end -end solutions for the different issues that customers have. That is why we are trying to diversify as much as possible. Why? So that at the end of the day, when a customer comes to us, we give them an end-to-end -end solution. As technology grows, cyber security becomes a concern where everyone must be protected. The executive director, Nita Yu, says plans are underway to strengthen cyber security across the spectrum. It's to form a committee, a committee of cyber security experts, cross-cutting -cut, all sectors of the economy. So cyber security is not just in information technology. We are, we are now going to petroleum and gas. We have transport. Someone can hack your transport system. You may think uh, transport is not prone to cyber but attack, but it can be. Joshua Kagoro, Miria Nwomjisha, UBC News. Government agencies are urged to clearly define the roles of the board and management. According to Ambassador Francis Butajira, the Chairman Board of Directors, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, micromanagement of the board members affects an entity's operations. Let's have a look. Clearly defined roles for the board of directors and management is key in strengthening the operations of government agencies. Most of the agencies have failed because the board wants to ascend in the arena and manage. And that has brought conflicts. For me, I've said no. Let's define our roles. In that way, we can perform our supervisory roles. So once we have done that, then we have left the management to, to do what they're supposed to do. And that's why we have achieved remarkable uh, results. Alongside management, the Board of Uganda Registration Services Bureau, led by Ambassador Francis Butajira, has focused on making Uganda the best investment destination. The Bureau has also intensified its efforts towards formalization of businesses. The one-stop center in the heart of Kampala City has been a major milestone in their operations. Before, an investor would run from place to one place to another. You come to your RSV to register a company. Then you are sent to KCC, for, for instance, for, for, for license. Then you are, you, you are sent to Ghana Revenue Authority to pay money. What we have done is to put in place what we call one-stop center. In this center, all the players are there. If you want to pay, you, you go and register. You get a license, KCC is there. If it is a land transaction, land people are there, 
and then you go to the bank. It's in the same place. Annually, the Bureau is given a non-tax revenue target by government. In the current financial year, the agency has a Uganda shillings 70 billion target. We have done 57. Before the end of the year, I can assure you, we are going even to hit 100 because of our improved processes. So that indicates, shows you how, how it's an indication of our performance that we, we are able to collect uh, the, this money. Although the entity has recorded significant successes in various fronts, there is belief that much more can be attained through creating more visibility. We have to communicate to the public the services we offer. If we are telling them to register a company, for instance, if we are telling them to, to, to register a trademark or a patent or a geographic indication, you know, all of these things, then they have the need to know what advantages am I going to get by just being, moving from informal to formal. Others fear that if you formalize business, the tax man will be on you. But we are saying no, there are other advantages. The role of the board of directors of any organization is to supervise and direct management on policy matters. Dennis Sikor for the Business Roundup. continue to be operated and maintained using prudent duty practices and equipment manufacturer's recommendation and if all required renewal and replacements are made on a timely basis over the coming years, the remaining useful life of the complex may be extended that at least Nanubale can run for the next 30 years and KPS can run for the next 50 years.